Um, let me just say that the advantage of living in the state of New York is that you happen to live in the best designed infrastructure or landscape in the country. Far and away the most efficient in terms of the wattage generated, so to speak, per ton of carbon dioxide produced. We are the greenest of green states and uh, the group in the northeast it's basically the work of designers from the Erie Canal to the railroads to the subways to the buildings. Basically they've made this by a factor of about three better than the rest of the country and most of the rest of the planet. So the problems I'm going to point out tonight are kind of what you get when you take physics fairly seriously. It's kind of a visionary enterprise. I don't compare myself in any way to Mr. Einstein or Feynman, but when you think in terms of physics, it gives you a framework with which to design. So there's beautiful physics that was done by Joshua Willard Gibbs, for example, the, maybe the only American theoretical physicist at Yale, and he looked at interfacial chemistry and interfacial thermodynamics, and it kind of tells us that the larger the interface, the better, the more functional capacity there is in the systems that are organized at that interface. Think the 600 linear miles around New York City. Think the connection between our buildings and our stormwater and our estuaries, all interfaces that basically organize, functionally configure the kind of reactions and the kind of climate transformations that can be affected. So what I'm going to say today, if it sounds like blame, in a way doesn't apply to you so much or to those of us who have designed in New York City. Not that we can't do better. We're in a good place altogether. But the, as, I, as I read it, and again, I have this, uh, these tinted glasses of biology, biogeochemistry, biophysics, uh, physics to look at this. As I look at it, there's uh, uh, very, very grave dangers in front of us. And for those of you who've had very, very long work days and are going to pass out during some part when the lights go out, I'll give the punchline now. Uh, unless we learn to design differently so that communities can control their population, their ecological footprint, and basically the way that the flow of materials through those communities can enhance their surroundings. Unless we do that, then the 45,000 acres of intertidal marsh that are fill around New York City, the fifth of the lowlands, as well as the lowlands of India and Bangladesh and Indonesia, where something like a quarter to a half billion people live, will be gone. That's not any theory. There's a inevitable impact when you put three atom molecules into the atmosphere. Those are antennae for infrared light. That has to be. You can play with this with the particulates and the rest. There's a lot of neat modeling uh, and interactive impacts. But you put a three carbon, a three atom molecule into the atmosphere and it will, I guarantee, not my guarantee, comes from about a century and a half ago, it will catch infrared light. And tell me if I'm wrong on this, it's got six choices looking at solid geometry. After it catches the light, the energy, it can go back up into the atmosphere back up out of the atmosphere. It can go to the left, to the right, to the front, to the back, or down. As a mathematician, I have to say the five-sixths of the chances are that it's going to stay in the atmosphere and heat the atmosphere up. Has to be. So our design choices will make a difference, but we have to address a number of problems altogether. And going back to really the history of the discipline of ecology, Exquisite thinkers, uh, uh, the Odom brothers, published texts and papers from the late 60s and earlier. Basically, the people who showed the NASA scientists that the capsules of space flight had to take human outputs and turn them back into potential human inputs, filtering with bacterial systems, cleaning the air with plants and the rest. This is the 1960s. Can you imagine the NASA engineers hearing this from ecologists back then? They probably cut a hold of it these days. 
But they realized that energy flows, Gibbsian model, energy has to be degraded every time it interacts with anything else. In that context altogether, <laughs> materials also flow, but in the landscapes we live in where two materials, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, are in shortly limiting, so tightly limiting supply, the flow is a circle because there's not enough to run the biotic systems. They, go, they basically aren't let out because to keep them in, every step, every Darwinian step, so to speak, every selective step that would keep those nutrients in would increase the signal, the amount of life, literally the, the quantity and probably also the diversity of beings on the planet. Those two principles, that energy flows, that materials flow in circles, are coupled with one other one, which has got a great deal of beautiful complexity and probably applies to much of your work and mine, and that is that systems develop. And I'm going to suggest a few ways, hopefully not in too long-winded a when you get started on a topic like this, you can put lots of slides together, as I'm sure you know from your own work. I hope I didn't do too many. Uh, but uh, how those systems develop, how we can actually couple the flows in our landscapes, the flows at our estuary edges, the flows of our buildings, the flows of materials off of and into our infrastructure, is going to be the make or break. Not for us, but we happen to live in the richest city at one of the richest periods of its history, when, in part because of spectacular designers that have been here, from John Jarvis to uh, many of the architects that people the place now. Uh, Calatrava obviously opened an office here for good reason. Um, we're going to have to show how these problems are solved. And the model isn't going to save the world itself. It's going to save the world because people will see that it works and it will go elsewhere because uh, the great thing that we have in New York is a great volume of material flowing through the place and a great deal of volume of argument. Very hard to get rid of, get, get away with pure nonsense in this city because there's always somebody smarter than you who's got the answer that you've got to answer back to get even again. It's a, a neat system. So, uh, some of um, uh, what I'll say will be uh, maybe a little difficult altogether, but um, I'm going to try to point to the positive sides altogether because the risks are, as I say, from physics, of atmospheres, what we're, uh, the atmosphere, what we're doing all together to travel and the rest. Not here, but much of the rest of the world and the country. China surpassed us today or recently in carbon dioxide outputs. Uh, <coughs> we're in uh, trouble just because of the organization of the planet we live in and the way we impact it. But risk also allows, if you incorporate the principles and the materials into the actual designs that process the stuff that Makes, us, makes it possible for us to live, opportunities. And I think those opportunities are almost by definition of about the same scale as the material flows that support us. It's great having my own computer because I know how to work it, I think. So not me, but the engineers um, recognize that um, as you increase the scale of pipes, um, you increase the risk altogether. Has to be. Uh, the, there's a number of reasons for that. The biggest one is, the largest one, is that pipes cannot filter because the flow through pipes is a fourth power function. That is to say, it's the scale of the pipe, the dimensions of it, plus time. So it moves stuff through so quickly that it can't be a filter. It's the opposite of a filter. It's a volume transport. Um, and the larger the landfill, the larger the pipe, the larger the risk. So why am I showing you this picture here? Because this is the largest landfill in the world over here. I'm pointing in the right place. Uh, fresh kills in New York City. But even worse than that, every, just about every linear foot of the landscape you're looking at is fill. And I'll show more of that later. Uh, 45,000 acres of fill over intertidal marsh, 70 square miles of New York City are fill from the waste stream, from the ash, from the dredge material, from the municipal garbage, from the uh, dredgings around the city altogether. And so that's, everything you're looking at is man-made. The regulators who are, work, or are fighting about the, uh, the wetlands that are growing on the edge, those wetlands are the equivalent of being man-made. They're growing on materials that we human beings put there. So the steeper the shoreline, the greater the risk because Bonks River altogether, once it gets to the top of this slope, 
which is really only there's two. Let me see if I get the numbers straight. Um, the Antarctic glacier is maybe worth four meters. Is that right? Twelve feet. Maybe five. So that's the top of this. So once the water gets up to there, Soundview Park is now shallow habitat. Not a perfect idea. The other one is about 60 feet. Um, and of course, then the level of the water would be up to that. Um, uh, that nice NYCHA house would have um, not waterfront property. It would be literally in the water altogether. So these are the time. It's not exactly clear how time is going to play out in that stuff. So Bronx River, but also this is just this happens to be a small fraction of that 70 square miles of city that's built on fill over tidal marsh. I'm standing on the uh, the Sims facility over on the, uh, the metal recycling facility under the side. I'll show you that in a bit. So this is the inevitable outcome if we stay on the track we are on. And time-wise, it's hard to see exactly, but you can see basically this pretty much shows you where that fill is, that 70 square miles. So all around Jamaica Bay, uh, much of Manhattan. Manhattan was much thinner. But you can see there's some natural part there, although John Jarvis built this railroad up here. And then the rest of the coast, there's fill there. There's fill in Sherman's Creek over here. Let me use the green. Um, just um, and uh, a fair amount of fill around the Bronx coast, about 2,000 acres. A huge amount of fill in Flushing. So that is the picture. This is what the no action hypothesis looks like. So this will be this will come to pass in the next 60, 80, 100. I don't know what the time frame is. Uh, the modelers are playing with this, but uh, maybe there's another way to go. So uh, and this is just a scaling of money because this is a Dutch city. We apparently are committed to money. So you know I, I haven't been able to. It seems to be true altogether. I I, I don't know anyone who can say it's not true. Uh, something like a billion tons of construction, C and D rubble a year cost about 30 a ton to get rid of it, although a lot of that is actually incorporated in the building price. So we don't see that as uh, export to landfills all the time. Some of it's used as fill. So something like 30 billion a year in that cost. Drinking water, we spend money for something like uh, 18 million a day. Stormwater, uh, you treat it for about $3 a hundred cubic feet or 750 gallons. So again, that's got a cost, 20 million uh, per inch of runoff from the city. Um, 10 mile length, just to give you an example. 10 miles, so say from the GW Bridge down to some place around the meat market. Uh, that's about, roughly speaking, uh, 10 billion gallons of water. So uh, just to put that in perspective. So we really, a lot of water goes through the city. I just uh, get that. It's really not a trivial amount altogether. Uh, and then uh, another aspect, this really flies in the face of the way we've done regulations to date with uh, the EPA and DEC. But the question is, what do you do when the world is going to be flooded and sea level is going to certainly rise? If, that's, if we're on that track, just want to put this in front of you because you're designers. Uh, you could build something like a 10-mile wave break out of this stuff here every year. So do we need it? Maybe. Uh, certainly, if there's going to be infrastructure that's valued at billions of dollars, rather than ship the material to other places, it would be better to build something. A fact I don't think I mentioned in this uh, lecture any place for some reason, uh, uh, Kachansky's book and a number of other sources. When the British were here trying to make sure we stayed a British colony, they did very, very good maps of the harbor because they had the best navy in the world. So we figured if the navy could come in, we couldn't win. Uh, luckily, they were wrong in that prediction. But they mapped 350 square miles of oyster reef in the greater New York Harbor. I'll say that again, 350 square miles of oyster reef. New York City, depending on how you count, is 322 square miles. The land masses of Staten Island, Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. Larger than the land mass of the city itself was the filtering ecological engineer, keystone species that lived in the harbor. So it gives you a sense of the scale of these things, the riches literally that made this country very easy to develop because we didn't have to bring food with us. We had it, so to speak, when uh, people arrived um, at Plymouth and in New York City altogether. Huge, huge, huge quantities of life. And oysters have about 100, 200 species that live with them. And every other species you or I could name is basically in some way dependent upon the kind of structures that they would put together. So um, the design requirements are going to probably require that we go 
uh, the risk is literally caused by increasing population growth, at the same time increasing the scale of the ecological footprint, and um, let's say minimal design steps to enhance ecosystem services. By ecosystem services, I mean the filtering and quality of life products from oxygen to clean air to basically getting rid of the, the hydrocarbons that go out into the environment don't just go away. There's pseudomonad bacteria in every cubic centimeter of rich soil that actually break down benzene, toluene, and the rest. So they're taken care of. We don't have to pay for that. It just happens because rich soils do that kind of work. So, but we're not looking at how to, mainly, we're not looking at how to increase those. And the problem is we hold in our hands, so to speak, in human industry, uh, some, and agriculture and uh, the rest, something like 40% of the primary productivity, how much, we, how much sunlight light captures. So in this part of the world, you can produce about a couple pounds of stuff per square meter. Rainforest is about 10 times that much, but it's never more than that. So we, about this much, about between a third and a half, flows through human cultures. So we basically have our hands in everything. So we have to be very careful if that's true then we have to basically, with the byproducts and waste products, give them back to the creatures that actually somehow support us. So the problem here, no widely distributed human, distributed human cultures act to increase biodiversity. The people we displaced here, a great book by Cronin, uh, Changes in the Land, showed that the Native Americans, actually by having cornfields and um, then leaving them go fallow and let the far, letting the forest come back, actually enhanced and increased biodiversity. The shallow burns under beech forests and the rest, they basically increased biodiversity. And they were starting with the richest temperate flora on the planet with the southern Appalachian province of the temperate. Go to Europe, they've got nothing like our flora. We're, we're um, something like a hundredfold more plants uh, in this part of the world. And the Native Americans somehow were able to work with that and increase it and enhance it. So a good trick, something that would be worthwhile to aim for every structure we build. But people have done that before, but then I'm gonna say, Groundwater recharge, probably the Native Americans did that. Oh, I should say, Henry Hudson uh, wrote, uh, he never saw anything like the corn supplies that he saw when he sailed up the river. I guess that was 400 years ago, uh, 1609. Uh, basically, uh, the Iroquois had, on, in the Hudson Valley, these piles that were just enormous. They were ship size, and uh, this had his, his ship. Uh, so, uh, very neat altogether. So they probably had an impact on groundwater. I'm telling you this because, again, those of you who had long work days, and I'm sure many of you did, it takes at least 25 grams of water, 25 pounds of water, to capture one part of carbon, one gram of carbon, one pound of carbon. So you throw it away, you make it into wastewater, and you've, you've lost the game. If the game is to basically make something productive, enhance ecological ecosystem services, you put it in a sewer, and that's gone. You want it to drop the temperature of the landscape, you can't do that. So I'm just saying that now, I'll give some details on it in a bit. And then, so that would be a critical thing to look at altogether. And then uh, increase intertidal and benthic habitat. Um, again, I, I mentioned the uh, oysters and the rest. We'll get into some more detail on that later. So basically, we'd like to figure out a way to design, to couple the bridges, the, uh, the piers, the, uh, the, the materials that we put um, at and in the water and next to it to actually make it a, an abode for life. Probably not that hard a trick, but you can't solve the problem unless you're confronted, obviously, and we haven't much to date. So, um, water, as I mentioned, carbon capture, um, and groundwater recharge should be something we look at everywhere, from central, the edges from Central Park West and Central Park and Riverside Drive and Riverside Park to our, um, our water supply altogether. And we don't really now. We have we have storm pipes that drive water directly into the trout streams and the rest. And as I say, once you do that, you've lost the game. Because if you put it in the groundwater, it will be filtered. It will enter the stream at 50 degrees, relatively clean altogether, uh, as opposed to what we're doing these days altogether. These problems are soluble. Um, Kiss and Cathcart, Greg Kiss and uh, myself and a few other people, uh, we didn't win this competition, but we're 153rd Street in, uh, in the Bronx, looked at a way of basically increasing the carbon capture, the water loss, the cooling factor. This kind of a structure, basically um, a bunch of stories with the vine coverage, not too difficult to do. Uh, they did it at the Ivy League colleges, obviously, without even thinking about it. Um, can drop, this would, with gray water or groundwater, recycled stormwater going in to feed those plants, it would change local climate, be between a couple and several degrees cooler 
and ambient uh, every day because, because, I'll show you this later, every gram of water when it evaporates takes with it 540 calories. It regulates the temperature in the terrestrial biosphere. It never gets much below 80, much above 80 degrees in the, temp in the tropical rainforest because even with the solar load, the plants are shading and evaporating water. And so they want to run around 80, and indeed they run around 80. And we could do the same thing with cities. If there's 26 square miles of rooftop, there's got to be 260 miles, 10 times that of size of buildings. I don't know if somebody figured this out, from, but it's got to be from you know, all the tall buildings and the rest. Anyway, uh, so you could actually increase the ecosystem services given the structures we build, uh, and it would be a lower cost. Uh, uh, Marielle Ezioni, just uh, uh, she, uh, this, uh, you can, if you walk under the bridge at 105th Street, uh, under the railroad bridge, these ferns are growing there. Uh, just happens essentially, they happen to find that habitat. We could obviously design for such things. We could actually uh, look at places where we could get groundwater seeps and actually have them covered with mosses and the rest and have the original landscape back again. But um, uh, just to show you that uh, uh, they'll make it even if we don't do anything. And it's really quite beautiful. It's a, uh, a great thing to see. We happen to live in a city that's glacially endowed. So the surface of Canada was scraped clean of beautiful soils and materials dropped here. It's ours for the taking. Uh, I'm going to say it's got something like a trillion gallons of stormwater holding capacity. And we have very many, many, many soils are on the rapid side. So you can, uh, something like you know, tens of inches to hour per hour to even uh, half an inch or a couple. So basically water goes into the ground. So uh, with some work, it's possible to couple sidewalks and rooftops and building sides and roadways and parking lots with capture treatment and recharge programs altogether. We haven't taken that as a model. Zero discharge, even for very large storms, means that, just from what I was saying before, every 25 gallons you capture, every 25 pounds of water you capture, about three gallons, can get you about a pound of biomass, probably less. It's probably more like twice that because plants aren't always perfectly efficient. But still, without the water, no plants. With the plants, the thermal regulators, the biodiversity producers, ecosystem services uh, are not here. And another problem is the steep slopes of the estuary edge. I'm looking down between a, a gap in a piece of sheet piling. And I just tell you this because in Europe they have a framework, a regulatory framework, where they uh, essentially regulate the length of the intertidal. If the intertidal looks like that or like this, it's zero because the length is essentially upright. You can double it with a 45 degrees or make it much larger. And that's an important thing if the sea level wants to go back and forth because the plants and animals can migrate up and down. But if you have, like I showed you with Soundview Park before, goes up to a certain point, you essentially have nothing until you have flooding as opposed to a place where organisms can migrate and where the mussels, the marsh plants, the shrimp and all that go with them can change faces. And you can see these are relatively sterile, probably not a good idea. As opposed to this, which was at the mouth of the outfall of the Pelham Bay landfill, these are rib mussels. They have a filtration capacity of something like 2,000 gallons per square foot. Um, and you can see there's a good number of mussels in a square foot. There's ways to grow them. I'm going to show you some ways to do that later. So basically creating, these are also keystone species. That is to say, like you folks, they're designers. They basically make structures that other organisms live in. Um, they do it because they kind of can attach one another with these neat bissel strands, very tough stuff for those of you who have taken mussels apart. And they hold the shoreline in place by attaching themselves to plants and other stuff. And that could be a way that we can modify shoreline ecological productivity. And you can see this highly um, technolog technologically fabricated material on which this oyster is attaching here. Uh, I think it's a tire. And here, about 100 years ago, a little more, uh, somebody dug a shoe out of the Chesapeake that was covered with oysters. So these structures, uh, happenstantially, can be almost anything. And we've made them so that they're somewhat easier to get um, full coverage of. So the point is that even our waste materials uh, can be colonizational services. Now, I'm not recommending we use tires. There's a number of hassles with them, but there's many, many, many other kinds of materials that we can and do make that can make a difference. Um, we have immense mass flows, and it was great when um, not so many years ago, uh, uh, John New went to the mayor and said, I'll pay you for all of the waste material you're now paying to dump um, in Pennsylvania. That was the commissioner of the uh, Department of Sanitation was saying at the same time it was too expensive to recycle. And then somebody walked into the mayor's office with a uh, pocket full of money and said, I'll pay you for it. I'll pay you for this stuff. I'll pay you for the plastics. I'll pay you for the metal. 
And so now, of course, it goes into boats to China, uh, but it's actually part of the wealth generation as opposed to a cost for the city of New York. And I'm just using this because it's a very exquisite model. Uh, Yugo New got the 20-year contract with the Department of Sanitation. It was sold to the Sims Corporation, and now it's essentially big business. And we need to look at other ways to use design in that way. Time is what we need to learn to design in. And this is the shoreline such as it is, as Google shows it. This is the old one. Okay, this is from 10,000 years ago when there was a mile of ice over this whole landscape here. And the ocean was out here a great distance. Uh, I don't know if I can see. There's a, some place here. There's a trench that goes a third of the way to Bermuda, which is the old Hudson River. But the point is that this is the kind of dynamic over longer time frames, but we have changed the time frame and degrees. We have to figure a way that our structures can actually regulate it so we don't get we don't get into this oscillation because the infrastructural damage and the population destruction would be enormous. And we have to somehow learn both wisdom and design and how to argue about things that will make a difference for very large scale processes, which is going to be new to us altogether. Again, back to this large landfill altogether. I want to say two things here. One is that there are something like 6,300 linear miles of roadway in New York City. And um, those roadways are not simply places, things that will take us from one place to another. They have to be design challenges because if the water goes off of those roadways, it's lost in the landscape. It's lost to thermal regulation in the city. It's lost in any enhancement quality. We have some of the greatest, New York City has got more parks per unit area than I think any city on the planet. Uh, the Bronx, where I live, has got more parks than any city on the planet. I know that for certain. But that's the North Bronx, actually. The South Bronx has got these parks that need to be built. And we can do it more readily if we can learn to couple runoff that now goes into sewers with runoff that we capture in systems that actually can filter it and do something with it. It's the Rorschach test. To, uh, everyone has to write down what they think of. No. These are the wetlands of historic Jamaica Bay. This is the landmass of historic Jamaica Bay. Wetlands, landmass, the two of them together. Um, there are some probably thousands of acres there. And you can see here it's basically filled across that abs along, not only to the absolute edge, but something like Kennedy Airport and Floyd Bennett Field are over the open water as well. So that's over open water, that's over open water. And the edge, the, the marsh, a thousand yards or more of marsh is entirely gone. So there we have, a, we have a Department of Environmental Conservation. We have a Clean Water Act that basically starts with the year 1972. But from what I showed you in terms of the thousand-year-old coastline and really just a hundred years of film, we have to think somewhat differently if we want functional capacities to be conserved in some way. So again, the amount of stuff is enormous. Drinking water, 1.2 billion gallons a day, which by the way is about the amount of filtration that you would get from about one square mile of oysters at standard densities. Intriguingly enough, there would be so another 350 square miles, but one would do about that much water. Wastewater, we add stormwater to it. Stormwater, about an inch of runoff of 300 square miles is 5 billion gallons. Combined sewer, fair problem. We dump 7, 27 billion gallons of untreated sewage in. Just to give you, to put it in scale, we get 40 inches of water each year about in rainfall, a little more, and that's something like 80 billion gallons from writing the zeros right. So you can see. But that's a large amount, but actually this amount is close to it because we use a lot of water that we get from upstate. Produce about a million tons of organic waste each year. And I'm telling you that because organic waste could be composted instead of being shipped to, Cal shipped to Pennsylvania at $100 a ton. And that would give you a capacity to basically treat brownfields and to create infiltration zones and to improve parklands around the city. Waste glass, because glass is essentially sand, silica dioxide, should we spend money to get rid of that or should we use it as a means of actually modifying the shoreline, modifying the landscape so that the, this dangerous um, precedent where as sea level rise comes, we have no places for organisms to retreat or move on. We have materials here, <coughs> five million yards of dredge material. Again, there's contaminants, there's issues. Should we couple them in some way? Maybe glass and the rest, we'll look at that later. 
I told you this story before, but um, just to get the picture, carbon dioxide, methane, it's three, or four, it's three or more atoms per molecule are basically, those are all antennae. So just to get this, it's a, this is the kind of inevitability of it that um, our president just got recently, uh, but um, uh, chemists have known for a century or more. Water vapor is also a greenhouse gas, not as strong as carbon dioxide, certainly not as strong as methane. And then there's um, ozone, a beautiful greenhouse gas because it actually, the atmosphere also makes it possible that we don't get fried because it picks up the ultraviolet in the atmosphere. And those of us who are lighter skinned would get, um, uh, there's a beautiful thymine dimers that are, that are formed by ultraviolet light when it hits our skin. Um, so uh, not beautiful, but how to do it beautifully. This is basically a way to rebuild oyster reefs. And it's a fairly simple structure. They're uh, essentially rebar type structures. You fill them with either oyster shells or it could be textured concrete or other stuff. And it's a way to protect this landscape here from waves. That would you see sand. That means that water's coming in at least uh, 30 centimeters a second, probably much, much faster. So big waves would be greater still, and you could put an environment at risk. So it's a design feature. Um, not perfect, but the idea is how could this be beautifully made and have minimal impacts on other things? Um, this is one structure I've made that apparently this structure's got about um, 50 young oysters on it uh, in New Jersey. It's basically just foam glass made from the glass waste stream. You expand it and it makes a textured material and that's embedded in concrete and you get algae, uh, seaweeds and uh, oysters and other creatures that's set to it. The principle, forget the structure, is that if you increase the interface scale you increase the opportunity for growth and development. That's the message to take home, basically. If you can increase the size of the space to which orga where organisms can live, they will. And here is a, a very neat material. This is a fuzzy rope, and I'm hopefully getting a large scale insulation by the waste, Hunts Point Wastewater Treatment Plant. Just putting this stuff in, it has the capacity to support about 17 pounds of mussels per square foot per year, uh, basically to, to develop about 17 pounds of, of mussels. So where we've lost the whole cosine, it's a way to potentially bring it back with something simple like floats and, um, and sinkers, basically with a material that's um, uh, either from the waste stream or from a very inexpensive uh, material. So the idea is to couple outputs with potential filters. And uh, the reason you want to do that is we lost the city of New Orleans maybe because of this, but we should be sensitive to the fact that New York City uh, is in Hurricane Alley itself. And I'll get more to that later. There's a, the positive side is that we have no more, very little shipping by comparison than the, compared to what there was. So how do you basically make it possible to build a pier when you have to dredge. And the simple answer to that is you take the dredge material and you build wetland type environments. Actually, I should have put one of the new uh, neat simulations there, but um, uh, let me just tell you, there's, these are basically uh, structures behind which one can put dredge material and put wetlands on top of them. I can't believe I didn't think of it but um, to, to show you, but the idea is this is a shallow part of the Passaic River contaminated with dioxins. These are basically biogeochemical reactors that uh, are designed to break down dioxins and PCBs and have wetland caps to increase the biological diversity at the same time. Um, design for water, building for ecological substrates. I've told you this already, uh, but um, we need to look at productivity with what we put in and near our built structures. There are something like 32 creeks in Jamaica Bay, had very variegated structures. They all look like this now. Again, uh, the Rush Act test, this is our coastline as it was. It's not that like that at all anymore. When you build something at the edge of a water body, it should come out looking something like this because that's about 50 to 100 fold greater surface area than the straight line that we produced. And in abstract terms, uh, this is uh, Mauna Loa, the carbon dioxide increase. What we have to do with our designs and kind of a kind of a model is this. Basically, we have to figure out ways that we can have enough ecological productivity and ratchet down our, our carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas production 
So that instead of rising, it falls. So basically, number of Priuses, number of light bulbs, decreasing the energy use of buildings, increasing the ecological productivity of the landscapes around us with water, with the organic waste that we produce to actually feed the plants and capture the carbon dioxide. If we don't do this, we're not so far from the ocean becoming so acidified that maybe it can't control its own pH. So this is sort of the model. We have to basically, we have to figure out how to do the inverse of this. And um, it's not going to be entirely done by building ecological systems. It's not going to be entirely done by developing technologies that are more energy efficient. It's going to be some marriage of those two. Again, the basic rules of ecology are straightforward flows and development, uh, all natural systems. But we haven't really turned these back on our own structures. So we are creating the constraints that actually diminish this overall capacity. It's development. The development requires the simple phrase to think of as interfaces, the connection between infrastructure and natural systems. We've ignored it, by and large. It's not true, of course. Olmsted built Central Park. They said, uh, you're, wasting the, you're wasting the resources of the city by putting that park in the center of this area, which is going to see the most development of any part of this whole landscape. And Olmsted said, no. Every, every property by this landscape will increase in value greater than any other property because of this structure. Damn if the man wasn't right, and it's still true. Olmsted Park's all over the country. Weequake Park in Newark, Prospect Park here, St. Louis, across the country and across, around the world. If you put green spaces in, you put blue spaces in, it makes the land more valuable because we intrinsically know that water, greenery, soils, our life, the diversity of the landscape, what, what, what kind of fits our, our hope for aesthetic is what we'll pay for. We'll, we'll invest our lives in it because it makes life better. Olmsted knew it, Thoreau knew it, uh, we should know it with everything we build. And again, it's the interface, it's the connection of stuff we build with water, with the stuff that sustains life. Soil, the most complicated, probably most important biogeochemical natural medium on Earth herself. <clears throat> so again, 40% of the nest primer, it's just a huge amount. We have a huge footprint. And I, I don't mean to beat you with this. I want you to make sure you can, when people start saying, we, why are we doing this? It's because we turn that around. It's that material, including the, the waste material altogether that are now so-called waste materials that can change the landscape. Also, human activity now does, we move more stuff than um, glaciers and other natural processes on the planet. So we're investing oil in moving materials I'm going to say, all right, all right, we're moving more materials, but now it's going to be design. It's going to be reconfiguring those materials so they sustain and enhance life processes that will make the difference. Olmsted had it intuitively, as well as being a great builder, six million yards of material he moved to make Central Park, if I have the number right. We move that material all the time now, but we're doing something with it that makes no sense ecologically. We're making structures that are essentially sterile and aren't adding values even to the uh, landscapes that we would like to be as beautiful as they could. So the principle is to utilize material flow uh, to increase ecological productivity. And again, to filter the air, filter the water, and in a word, make life better. Um, so again, cash flows, dollars and cents. Uh, we can skip that. We looked at it before. Um, so we ship this to Pennsylvania, as I mentioned. Uh, they'd love to see it over there. Uh, and it costs about $100 million each year to get it out. Um, uh, we get rid of glass waste. Uh, we use some of it as landfill cover, but again, um, some millions of dollars for that. Uh, the, the worst of it probably is the dredge material because this was once one of the most important ports on the planet. And um, it could be again, but uh, the other option to look at, and this is more as voters and as designers, although anybody involved in the estuary edge, uh, we could potentially use dredge material, even those that are contaminated. And everyone talks about clean caps. So we happen to have something like 2,000 tons a day of waste glass, which we could cap um, literally square miles of this other material while making wetland systems. So again, there's ways of decontaminating them. We have to look at this 
uh, literally as a way to uh, float a city that happens to be on an estuary that's changing shape uh, by the day. Um, and the other side of it is a million tons of organic waste, about what we produce each year, could uh, clean up about 300 acres of brown fields or just increase the soil water holding capacity of other landscapes. The Audubon golf courses, uh, essentially to keep the pests down and to increase the plant growth, they take compost and they put a, between about a half inch and a few inches of, use of um, finished compost on the fairways each year and it increases the water holding capacity and decreases the need for any kind of herbicide or pesticide because the uh, biota, the bacteria and fungi in humus actually protect the grass from other kinds of diseases. Uh, glass, again, has got an area impact. Just how large a space could we make a difference in? And just if people are uh, looking to design landscapes that are at park edges, we have literally 600 or so linear miles of man-made edge it's going to stay that way. Obviously, we've made it all over. But how could you actually increase the habitat value without doing damage? And uh, the waste materials, I think, are the intrinsic first step. Um, and this will be a more and more important issue because our infrastructure is often by the coastal edge. We can't actually stop global warming and sea level rise, but we could stop wave-driven damage probably pretty readily. Um, we ask this question uh, all the time, but I'm going to just try and reconfigure this um, question so it has a more of a meaningful interpretation in terms of natural history. The biological diversity of our region is enormous, and to assume that we can simply live without it is not an assumption that the, the likes of Olmsted uh, or any of the great um, uh, designers of English gardens to uh, the notion that um, uh, the Pennsylvania School brought to landscape design. So we're not designing for a multiple of beings. We essentially are designing for exclusion. And as I mentioned before, the Bronx would have the most green spaces, the most parkland of any city on the planet were it a city by itself. But that's only the North Bronx. That is to say, all the parks, because of Teddy Roosevelt's friends, actually laid out the Pelham Bay Park, which I live almost in, in City Island, connected to Pelham Bay Parkway, connected to Bronx Park, the Bronx Zoo and Botanical Garden, connected to Marshall Parkway, connected to another beautiful park where there's literally nesting great horned owls and uh, uh, Cooper's Hawks, uh, Van Cortland Park, connected by a parkway to Riverside Park. The whole area is a greenway, and we're doing this again. But the South Bronx, uh, the areas in uh, Long Island City, uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, have no parkland. So we have to go, the mayor is actually on this aim altogether, but we have to, the who, uh, has to include both those that don't have the wherewithal to compel politicians to do what they want, but also uh, every ecologist up to relatively few years ago was raised on a farm, raised with experience with the biota, with the plants and animals. We don't have that in the city. If we're going to literally make it possible for another generation of natural historians, of ecologists, biologists, landscape designers to come with hands-on sense of how beings are and live, it's going to have to be by growing up with them, by playing as a two-year-old with uh, worms and roly-polies and polyctid bees and things that um, uh, you don't get to see in the city itself. So the design requirements are that we have spaces where the beings that educate us into how the world works can also be there. Uh, and the what has got to include the world that actually and somehow improves, improves our landscape. There is, in a s cubic centimeter of soil, 2,000 square meters of surface area. A cubic centimeter of forest floor or meadow holds something like 10 million to 10 million bacteria. A square meter of forest or meadow has something like 15 to 20 linear miles of fine roots. You have to build 
for those beings that will do the work that will keep life livable. And you don't need to know the numbers, although counting roots is not a bad thing to do sometimes, just to see how magnificently integrated they are. And I didn't even count the hyphae of the fungi, which has got to be an order of magnitude. As they, if it's 15 miles of linear roots, it's got to be 150 or 1,500 of the, fungi, of the fungal hyphae and uh, fibers. But we have to, in a way, make space for the beings that make this space for us. And it's a simple principle. All of the, everything I'm saying to you, I could lay out both design principles and specific metrics that we could look at to actually see how to make it work this way. But we have kind of, you know, we got the aesthetic. Again, we live in this city with the most green space with, uh, with the likes of Olmsted and, uh, and, and many others um, as, our, as our legacy. But we now have to take this as a design principle to get something a little better for all, including the beings who make it possible for us. Again, a simple thing in some ways. Our byproducts can do this. Uh, the measures are straightforward, and it's a metric to start with, to think with altogether. And we have to, uh, and it's, it's great, we've got the right mayor at the right time, I think. Um, efficiencies of scale, critical altogether, but then there's an integrity issue, which we have not particularly designed on a locale. Ecological systems are essentially distributed. They cannot be centralized. So you make a pipe, you destroy them. So sometimes you have to put pipes in. But what's the optim where is the optimal relation? If, and we, enough water passes through our systems. That 1.2 billion gallons of water I mentioned before, and this is something that um, you can utilize and people can deal with this all together, 1.2 billion gallons of water spread over the 300 square miles of New York City would be about a heap of half of that. The gray water would be something like this much water over the year. In other words, 40, 48 inches, enough water to make New York City into a temperate rainforest if you're so inclined. Um, you can make buildings, make neighborhoods, make tree pits, make rain gardens, make landscapes work very, very differently. There's health issues, that's right. All these things have to be argued out. We have to get the health department, we have to get DOP, DEP, DOT, into this argument and into this discussion altogether. But the integrity issue, it costs us the most expensive, 70% of our energy goes into running the 14 wastewater treatment plants in New York City and taking something like gray water and storm water and treating it on site would change that equation, maybe exceedingly favorably altogether. Urban heat island, again, could be reversed with the power of water. Uh, I'll give you the physics again in a second, but every six gallons of water evaporated, evapotranspired by vegetation, is equal to a ton of air conditioning, a much enough to cool a 400 square foot space each day in the city of New York. Um, and in non-point pollution altogether, we have something like 26 square miles of rooftop, the roadway I mentioned before. So um, there's opportunities here, which we need to realize uh, the more we can. I, again, I mentioned before, I don't know if you can read that, but um, uh, something like there's no reason to move water off the landscape. There's, of course, many problems. The surface of the land is very compacted. So we actually have to look into the a low-grade environment, but I mentioned it's all scraped off of, not largely shaped off, scraped off the Canadian Shield, and it's um, worthwhile to remember that um, uh, if you can get through the, it's like dealing with personalities, you know, you get through the, the hard surface, there's something much more soft and giving below. In this case, there's a landscape that can actually absorb a huge amount of water. Again, a trillion gallons, conservatively estimated, uh, thousands of times more than we produce uh, as runoff altogether. Just to give you a kind of picture of how much water evaporates out of Central Park, say it's a, something like five millimeters a day would be standard. Uh, that's the equivalent of water vapor about 20 feet tall each day. Luckily it mixes, otherwise we would all asphyxiate because all you'd be breathing would be water vapor, but because it's lighter, it supports us in that way. And there's ways that we could change the landscape and we could these tree plantings could behave very differently. If you simply put, i show you in a second, these are storm chambers, probably the least expensive of the below-grade capture systems. If you put one of these with each tree, you could capture something like 1,000 gallons per tree, which would mean a million trees would capture a billion <laughs> gallons of water, which would mean that that would put an end to the combined sewer problem. Roughly speaking, I think that number is about right. So uh, this is the Parks Department has been building Green Street Parks. This is connected to, this is by our, our design basically, but this is a uh, 
trench drain. It, from 110th Street feeds this vegetation here. There's a bunch of problems. We've got to play with the micro topography so the water, when the, when the people wash their cars over 110th Street, I want the water to come in and it's not set up now to do that. I want to get very small flows into the system, but larger flows into the sewer. And that's uh, a trick, but that's just a design issue altogether. Uh, but there are now about 12 or so Green Street parks that are hydrologically connected to their surroundings. It's going to be greater still. But I, uh, oh, I want to say that something like the Atlantic Yards, uh, uh, for a relatively few hundred thousand dollars, the 22-acre site could capture um, about a, a couple inches of water and literally change the whole climate of uh, Flatbush Avenue, Atlantic Avenue altogether. Did Radner think of that? I don't think so. Would he be interested? I'm not sure. But the point is that large-scale designs could have large-scale impacts, favorable impacts, if they were designed to incorporate natural systems and otherwise waste materials, that, waste stuff that's generated from them. Um, so my humble little uh, oyster material, a lollipop made on recycled reinforcement bar and um, foam glass, a kind of uh, image of how you could use dredge materials and other waste glass or the like to build uh, wetlands around um, the Brooklyn Bridge footment, uh, footings. Uh, again, this is the 10,000 cubic yards of sediment around the metal management. I'm hoping a meeting on that this weekend. Hopefully we'll get to restore Greenport type development. And the Passaic River can't be dredged now because of dioxins. And because it can't be dredged, every time there's a big storm, the dioxins are washed downstream. Catch 22. So the idea is how do you change that? And the way you change it, I think, is to create something like a, again, a capping system that both treats the dredge material and creates the depth you need for moving vessels into the landscape. This is the El Jardín de Paraíso, the biogeochemical cap. You can get from the city of New York, maybe for free, uh, the composted biosolids, which are high in iron, manganese, and phosphorus. This is uh, what they're going to make into the children's garden, 9,000 parts per million lead, iron, manganese, and phosphorus, bind lead mole for mole so that when it's been fed to rats and pigs, there's no, red, no, no lead taken up by the, in, the, in the bloodstream. Probably be true for children, not the test you want to do on them, but they'll certainly do it on themselves. So the idea is to use a waste product bone meal, something that will actually absorb the material and make it possible to use this landscape. I'm told there's many, many, many problems like this because traffic used to produce over on the Fifth Street here. Um, tetraethyl lead would produce aerosols, it would get washed again, uh, blown against the wall and then washed down into the soil. So it's everywhere. It's all over the place because we had leaded gasoline not too long ago. But it's a problem. You don't need to spend $30 or $50 a yard to get rid of the material. It can be dealt with on site as the aim. And uh, this is what the uh, Thomas Muse and Bill Young helped me design on the site. And this is what it looks like actually last year. Uh, oh, there's a frog in there someplace, but I guess we lost it. Uh, so everything you build is a kind of hypothesis on how the world can work. And uh, it's kind of critical to look at. So this is, a, this is a null hypothesis. Basically, if we go down the path we're on, then the city will look like this when part of that glacier in Antarctica, or part of the glacier in Antarctica plus the one in uh, Greenland melt. No. So that's, this, this is the inevitable outcome of going down the same path we're on. Uh, so what to do is a question. Now oh, there's the frog. Uh, if you build wetlands, of course, they have about five to 10 times as much carbon capturing capacity and are also treatment environments for the water. So the stormwater could be either run into the combined sewer or uh, if this guy could vote, I think, or lady, I think they would go for something else. This is the first green roof was built in the Bronx. It's uh, my lightweight soil. Uh, so it's 30 cubic yards of recycled expanded polystyrene, five cubic yards of composted organics. And it's created a green space for students on top of this um, area, capturing carbon, treating water, cooling the local environment by degrees. And again, two millimeters of water is equivalent to a ton of air conditioning. We get um, about five or 10 times that per day. A neat piece, I'm not going to concentrate on today, but every, if you put a green roof by an HVAC intake, according to the carrier people who make these things, every one degree Fahrenheit drop is a 1% increase in efficiency of your air conditioning unit. Real money very, very quickly. So if that cost is significant to people in the building, it's something that's good to know. And again, um, how big? Uh, we have to kind of think at decent scale. 
26 square miles with 10% coverage would capture about 50 million gallons of water per storm. Not a huge amount, but not nothing. A million cubic yards of EPS from the extended polystyrene from the waste stream if you use my soil. And whatever soil you use, if you compost in a city, about a million yards of organic waste uh, uh, as well, $100 million a year, uh, uh, thereabouts. System built on the Bronx River, uh, Yuga New Society, now Sims on the Bronx River. So basically just by putting in very low cost structures, these are about $300 each. Um, it's um, actually it's now built, but um, the idea is to uh, create a zero discharge system and uh, this basically water will drain off the concrete here into a green swale. Below grade we've got about uh, eight solar pumps that will cycle the material through a wet meadow, through a wetland system, and then it'll be evaporated off of a moss wall. And the cost of it was about um, something like 70 cents a gallon. So uh, it's not nothing, but basically it means that there will be no discharge into the Bronx River or any such system. And the neat thing is you could use it to raise land in the case where you've got sea level rise. Uh, the volume of these, you can see there's gravel being put over, the, over here. You could actually use um, recycled uh, concrete and uh, brick and material, RICA, uh, uh, RCA type material, and get the land up to a higher level and have this water holding capacity and also create with the pumps, pumping systems look like they're 40-ish K, um, not dirt cheap, but uh, that's because there's batteries, because I, I want the site to be much cooler than ambient uh, in the morning. So if we actually evaporate water during the summer, the cool air will fall off the moss wall, roll over the concrete site, so it will be um, between two and about five degrees cooler than um, the surrounding landscape, so it will be a much better working environment. And that kind of was an added expense that maybe you didn't have to do. But So uh, a neat fact, um, six millimeters of water off of two and a half acres is the equivalent of 15 tons of dynamite. There's power for you. Uh, this water has got this huge energy moving capacity only if you evaporate it by structures like this. It doesn't have to be that big. But basically that's what runs the water cycle and that's what keeps the planet closer to the kind of temperature that the plants like and we like altogether. Um, high le either the upper leaves or spines of cactuses basically do the work of re-radiating the high temperature input. They don't do any photosynthesis, the upper leaves, but <clears throat> cactus isn't a good example. But um, in this case here, these leaves are several degrees below ambient. And that's what's making the forest or Central Park cool on a daily basis. So optimize water holding, capture stormwater, and again, we have water that now costs us money to treat that could literally change the climate of the city were we to use it somewhat differently. And the physics, uh, the chemistry basically I mentioned nitrogen and phosphorus, um, that's in our organic waste for shipping elsewhere and um, essential for plant growth which means really not just the plants but in our part of the world feeding migrating birds and migrating butterflies. 540 calories per gram. Uh, water also heats, so uh, it seems like it's damp and unpleasant by wet areas, but it uh, actually is warmer. So the old farmers used to put barrels of water into their barns because that would mean the apples wouldn't freeze until all the water was frozen. So by uh, insulating the barns with um, earth and all, they could keep the carrots, the potatoes, everything else from freezing. And the same thing happens here. You'll notice the average temperature wants to stay right around 32 degrees because until all the water is frozen, it's giving off 80 calories, not as much as the 540 it's taking away, but it's, um, we should ignore that side of it. Uh, heat of fusion, so maybe too late in the day for physics. Um, uh, if we just took, remember that's just part of an inch, five billion gallons is an inch of water over the whole city, but 307 is wrong, I think it's 322 according to Google, but whatever the number is. Uh, just uh, uh, part of an inch of water evaporated each day would drop the temperature a couple of degrees. So that's the trick to figure out how to couple plantings and vegetation on a very widely, di di uh, widely distributed uh, uh, framework altogether. So matter into habitat. Designing for water, remember, it takes something like 25 to 55 times as much water to get carbon, but that's the really 
this carbon capture in New York City is not going to turn the world around. But if you design something that does this, then people will look at this design and maybe build it elsewhere. So already New York City, New York State is far and away the greenest. But to do this, to show that it can be done, will change the way it's done in the Kansas cities of the world and the, uh, maybe the Las Vegas is God help us. Um, and uh, the aim is to make it possible for the land to be productive. Again, a square meter of this landscape produces about two pounds of matter, catches two pounds of carbon every year with water. So how can we, how can we actually couple our landscape so it literally makes the air better, makes it so we pay less for our combined sewer and our wastewater operation, at the same time makes neighborhoods better, the same way Olmsted showed us to do not so long ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, more physics. I think it's, it's late for physics. Um, the problem is that we have really thought in the way the codes are laid out, the way the planning framework gets us to address things, what uh, one ecologist called it, uh, it's death by a thousand cuts. We make these small decisions and the kind of larger framework of how the world organizes itself, literally self-organization in the biosphere, in biogeochemical and ecological communities, is not something that we can easily incorporate. But I think by looking at the way projects intersect with their landscapes, again, if Ratner had said, okay, we're gonna capture, we're gonna capture a 10 year storm off of this 22 square, 22 acre site that I'm developing, uh, people would have listened in a diff different way, I think. Yeah, people, there's still, this is, this is New York City, you're still gonna hear criticism no matter what you do. Yeah, that's been my experience. But if you can actually change the local climate because of some design steps, cost-effective design steps, if you can change the air quality, you can change the mortality increasing particulates, the micron, the tenth of a micron pieces that actually increase the asthma and respiratory disease and death rate in areas, that will change the way people look at our designs. You can increase the coverage by plant leaves, by soil systems, that will happen. So all of the research has not been done, but enough has been done to show this all together. Cornell, University of Michigan, a bunch of European universities all together. And that's, I think, we need that high ground altogether. Infiltration, critical. On the one hand, there's thermal, thermal shock to the poor trout and the caddis flies and the rest. But the other side is just the wasteful side of it. You know, to throw away uh, 25 pounds of water and give up the pound of carbon that could be supporting other life forms on the planet while we're doing damage and actually decreasing the value of the landscape we're building seems like a waste and I think it's just have to see it and maybe things can be done somewhat differently. We have a watershed um, that uh, basically has runoff going into the trout streams. If anyone builds up in the Catskill, Delaware or Croton, uh, very, very simple structures um, can be built that make a huge difference. If we could think like this large rodent, um, this beaver, these beavers, 835 meters, a um, couple thousand, half a mile, roughly speaking, uh, just a terrace. It holds immense amounts of water, millions of gallons of water, just by microtopographical, just very small modifications of the landscape. Do we, are we gonna be shown up by something with teeth like that? Anyway, beautiful creatures all together. And it's just scale. We are looking at the wrong scale. We're not looking at exactly what's around us to see how the modifications can be made. So microtopography, microhydrology, micro, micro uh, habitat can be modified in a way that's favorable to not just one creature, but to many, many, many creatures. So stepping down from roadsides, you can have multiple terraces, almost nothing to build with a small excavator, some logs, some gabions if you need to go that far. And you can catch literally millions of gallons per linear mile of roadway by simply modifying the landscape downhill from it in a way that most people looking at it using logs and small ditches and the rest wouldn't even see it. The beautiful old stone, dry stone uh, structures throughout the whole watershed altogether were built by hand by farmers. 
sometimes along contour lines, and are tremendous stormwater dissipators because the leaves pile up behind them. They create these macropores, this infiltration gallery, and the water goes down. The cost of it is something beautiful. Uh, I think you could say the same thing about the beavers altogether. They had something 100 years ago from Bog Brook up in the Croton. And uh, again, it's simply very, very minor modifications that change the landscape so that it works not just for one creature, it certainly works for us in terms of catching water, but for all. So all structures are hypotheses on how the world works. The null hypothesis doesn't work anymore. If we keep on that path, we're guaranteed to see immense damages to ourselves, our landscapes, and literally uh, a quarter to half a billion of the world's population who live in coastal areas as well as about a fifth of the landscape in New York City and our infrastructure. We need to look at our populations and how literally life can be happy enough without so many children diminishing our ecological footprints and enhancing ecosystem services and increasing biodiversity. But this is an aesthetic game, really, that you're better at than I am. Uh, you look at catching water and coupling it with maybe the richest palette of temperate plants on Earth, as well as soils and structures that can be um, anything from a Zen garden to um, an English landscape. And that's our opportunity as well as our challenge. I'll stop here.